82 episodes in, we are still rookies. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I am also Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we're back to talk about video games. Yes, and we brought in a special guest, a video game expert. Hello. Ryan is not actually a video game, game I, expert, I, but I, he has been playing video games since he was a small, tiny gamesman. Gamesman, I like it. Yeah. It's so, a, we, we need a new term. So yeah. We do, and I like the idea of, like, games person. Um, yeah, you know, we want to talk about formative video games, like video games that sort of changed who we are. I mean, video games are art, as has been recognized to varying degrees, and art's job is to change you. Mm-hmm. Art's job is to make you think and feel things that you didn't feel before. So, video games do that. And they certainly do that for me, and they certainly do that for the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And so, Icebreaker, mm-hmm. when you always guest always goes first. Oh. R- Ryan, new Ryan, better Ryan. Oh. Ooh. What is your throne. What is your strongest gaming memory? So, strongest gaming memory is probably the most ridiculous gaming memory for me. <laughs> uh, nice. This was myself and a few friends in. I want to say grade school, but I'm rather fuzzy on dates. Going camping in my friend's yard. We're talking, supposed to be talking about video games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, okay. we're, we're getting there. Right. Just, it's a journey. We're okay. going on a journey together. Yeah. Game Boys. Uh, if, if it was only that, it wouldn't be that ridiculous. Uh, okay. So we set up the tents, and we set up the extension cords. Because what we have decided to do is bring our TVs, the tiny little CRTs that we all used to have in various forms, Mm -hmm. uh, and hook up our Xboxes. Nice. (laughs) And play them in the tent. Nice. (laughs) The even more ridiculous part on top of this is that we were not playing Halo against each other, as we often did. Uh, Instead, we were all playing Morrowind. (laughs) <laughs> Three different versions at the same time. Nice. Doing completely I dig different it. things. I dig it. Not really interacting in any way, but, you know, we had all spent hundreds of hours doing this and we were going to spend a few hundred more. Uh, I believe I was actually on my second Xbox at this point because the first one had burned out and I had already sunk 100 hours into Morrowind and I was on my way to the next hundred. Nice. Yeah. I remember thinking about Morrowind. I, I had a friend who. He had a really crappy computer, and so he would come over, because I was super into Morrowind, and he would come over, he would like drive into town, and he would play Morrowind, and we would just hang out. Like, because I was playing it the whole rest of the time. Yeah. And he couldn't. <laughs> um, that is not my strongest gaming, gaming memory. Um... When I was a kid, when I was when I was merely a tiny lad, I was in I, I must have been in the fifth grade. Uh, I had an NES, and I played I played all kinds of stuff. Like I didn't have a lot of games, um, but that was where I got into Final Fantasy, and the idea of RPGs. But my I, I played Wizards and Warriors like crazy, and every day before school. I would get up, eat breakfast, and then start to finish play Wizards and Warriors. Like I had it down to a science where, like, by the time, as long as I was quick enough, and as long as the game didn't like crash, because it was a Nintendo. By the time my mom was like, "Jim, it's time for school," I would just be finishing the final boss. <laughs> See, and I was up watching Kratz Creatures. I never TV. I didn't have cable. Sorry, I did have a TV, obviously, because I had a Nintendo, but I didn't have cable. Yeah. So it was Nintendo, or it was Nintendo or nothing. Hmm. How about you, Huck? Uh, I mean, other Ryan. <laughs> yeah, the other Ryan, the, the lesser Ryan. Um, I didn't say that. You said that. I did. Um, so I mean, I had a lot of uh, video gaming experience growing up, um, but it's funny when we were doing the pre-show, I was hard pressed to find something that was super, super. Like strong and meaningful from an early age, uh, beyond like games that I really fixated on, uh, and it wasn't really until we got talking about like my university time that I realized that um, Rock Band Two 
is probably the one that I have the strongest um, memory affinity for. Um, I don't really do a lot of online gaming, so when I play games with others, it's usually locally. Um, and strangely enough, like Rock Band 2 seems to have been the perfect iteration of that. Rock Band 3 had some mechanics that made improvements. Rock Band 4 was certainly interesting, but for us, Rock Band 2 was, was where it was at. And so, I mean, that's the, the Rock Band 2 parties that my uh, former roommate, uh, Doug, uh, hosted. Well, he, I guess he more or less started hosting them, um, became a thing. They were the Rock Tales. That was where we played Rock Band and mixed cocktails. Which was which was never good enough, or it was it was never uh, sorry. It was always superior to Guitar Bureau, which was Guitar Hero and beer. Oh, no. It just wasn't as good. Rock Tales, Rock Band, and Cocktails, and it was like when you're a kid, you stay up as late as you can, and of course, there's an element of diminishing returns there as the alcohol takes effect. But the very first Rock Tale was the Endless Set List, which was you know play through all of the songs. Um, and so we ha- we did a whole bunch of these different games, and I would say, like, Jim, I think you, you said it best, that the fact that I'm going to have a rock tail for my bachelor party instead yep. of a traditional bachelor party probably speaks to how strongly I am, I feel affinity towards rock bands. So. Yep. So that is that is my strongest gaming memory. That reminds me, we need to talk about that, because I have some schemes. Oh. Um, but not, <laughs> not, not today, not on this podcast. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean, video games make you feel things, they make you do things, they change who you are, they change what you think, they change how you live your life sometimes. I mean, in the same way that books do. Mm. Um, like, it seems weird to talk about video games that way, but but it is, it, it is perfectly natural to talk about books that way. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the notion of our, our formative books, we've talked about them a bunch. Mm-hmm. I would actually say the video games have been more formative to me than any books I've read. Mm. Which... Oh. I feel book. bad about as a nah, avid book so. as an avid book reader and language nerd in general. That feels wrong, but it also feels right. I, th- I think that um, what you lose in the ability to expand upon in your imagination, the interaction that you get from a video game, is, is much different than reading somebody else's story. So uh, I, I can see that. I don't think you should feel any shame about that. Yeah. So games that make you feel things. Okay. Uh huh. Go. Uh, so, we've explored this on the podcast before, that I have serious problems with feels and man-feels. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have normal you emotions, have apparently. feelings. Yeah, I, I don't have normal, normal emotions. I keep uh, those feelings in the man place. Yeah, and when they come out, it's usually a single, like, misty tear to the eye. Yeah, the, the man tear. The man tear. Oh uh, I mean, I had one this, this past weekend. Uh, I was playing, and I finished the, the campaign mode for uh, Titanfall 2, and uh, sorry to give it away, but the, the Titan is an AI uh, you know, mech exosuit, and it sacrifices itself to, to save everybody, right? And so I had a man-feel moment, I was texting my fiancé about it, you know, like, I got the man-feels from a robot, and she just rolls her eyes, and I, I know she's rolling her eyes about that. Not, not to be confused with the, the, the soon-to-exist, probably-already-does-exist future where you can get man feels from a robot. Oh uh, yeah, I guess that's true. A different that, kind of man feel. Yeah, that already exists. Oh, that's we totally have effect. the technology. <laughs> yes, I figured. Um, so, so when I get invested in stories, it's usually because I'm I'm invested in characters, um, and I would say Nintendo, like uh, Nintendo Entertainment System, and Super Nintendo Entertainment System. I played a lot of those games, but they were more puzzle games not puzzle games but they were puzzles for me to solve platforms and whatnot mm-hmm. Mario and whatnot so I, I never felt that emotional connection it wasn't until the N64 when there was a sufficient amount of processing power to bring the characters to life so I mean I felt that way with Shadows of the Empire even though I was Dash Rendar because it was first person and you took on different you know modes like the, the uh, not the Millennium Falcon whatever his was Star Runner. I can't even remember what the name of. Please the, don't make me remember. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But the, the non Millennium Falcon ship, and then the speeder bikes and stuff. So I, I had I had emotional connections with that. But the strongest to get to the actual point, Ryan, <laughs> the strongest emotional connection I got with the game initially was Star Fox sixty four. I knew I was supposed to be Fox McCloud, but when Slippy's in trouble and Falco's in trouble... When Slippy's in trouble, you leave him to die. No, no, I always went to rescue him, even though he yelled at me and whatnot, but... Uh, and, um... Uh, oh, fuck, what was the rabbit's name? 
It's escaping me off the top of my head. Everybody's thinking. We've all no. had the no, no. no. I, 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 I tried, but then I no. That that's gone. Anyways, I what? choose to believe it's Bucky O'Hare. Okay, well, well when Bucky O'Hare is trying to impart knowledge upon you, you know, and, and Cross, you know, we're going to get so many up actually. So. Uh, Cross over. Yeah. Right. Anyways, um, I. It was the first time that a game made me kind of lose the sense that I was me playing a game and more that I was a part of a team. Um, you know, I think it's the, f- the fourth level when you're in a dogfight skirmish and that's the first time you meet, like, the yeah, enemy team and whatnot and you're just dogfighting over top of this, this alien ship, you know. I legitimately felt invested in it. I felt bad whenever I died. Granted, that was usually Slippy going, you let, no! you, let the, you let the team down. I let yeah. the team down. Even though I was the one dying in there. Anyways. But, God. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I had strong feels from that game. Uh, strong, I guess, boy feels. Not quite man feels. They hadn't quite evolved yet. But <laughs> that, that was that's my uh, strongest feels from video games. How about you? Better, Ryan. <laughs> uh, so, I have a bunch of games that I think would kind of qualify as they made me feel things. Um a lot of the time frustration in that oh my god how did I die for the 10 billionth time on Rainbow Road falling off the edge at 150 <laughs> cc's uh, but I think for me it's actually a more recent game that really made me feel the man feels if I could borrow the term oh my god. yes you may uh, this was The Walking Dead the season one of The Walking Dead by the uh, Telltale um I have not been quite so involved in a video game story in the same small personal way that I was with this game. I actually get invested in the worlds, and Jim can attest to this. I like finding out how the world works. I usually don't care as much about the individual characters, because the individual character is usually pretty flat. Like, there's not a lot there. Um, There's the occasional interesting one, but the world is much more interesting. But here, I don't want to know more about the world. The Walking Dead is an awful world. No one wants to be there. <laughs> uh, those of you who are still watching the show, how? How are you still watching that? Uh, but the characters really drew me in. Um, and I don't want to spoil it, but the train episode starts with you interacting with one character in a very adorable way and ends on a very tragic note. For a number of characters that... Do they die? But they die. I haven't seen The Walking Dead, but I'm familiar with the concept. Yeah, a lot of... There's there's some death. I read the comic. Um, right. But, yeah. the I actually cried at the end of that game. This nice. was the first game that made me cry. Nice. And I'm not talking a single man tear. Like, I had legitimate tears. I had to sit down, let that out, and sort of come to some sort of settlement with myself for what just happened. Uh, And I was playing this game episodically as it came out, so I didn't even know what was happening next, so it really felt like a drawn-out thing. Uh, But that that is probably the strongest feels that I've had from a video game. So I was going to talk about Spec Ops The Line, which I think I've talked about before, um, and sort of the way that it weirded me out. But Thomas Was Alone is a much better example. Uh, I love Thomas Was Alone. I think I did a Friday Favorites video uh, last year on it, and I'll link it in the show notes if I did. But it is a story. is It's a it's a puzzle platformer, um, barely puzzles, just mostly platforms, all about rectangles, tiny little rectangles. They don't have voices. Everything is narrated by the same person, who just tells this story about these rectangles and who they are, and like. Thomas is a rectangle who likes jumping. And he jumps up and to the right and meets other rectangles, like Chris, who's an asshole. And Claire, who's the biggest rectangle but has a superpower. And Laura, who is really self-conscious uh, and is very flat and can't really jump at all. Um, but, but she's bouncy. And, and there's this whole story about these rectangles. Chris and Laura um, fall in love because Chris is a is a square. He's very small, uh, and he's a shitty jumper. And Laura is also a shitty jumper. But with Laura's help, Chris can 
bounce much higher than he could normally jump. Um, and so Laura becomes the only person that he likes. And he doesn't want Laura to be self-conscious about um, the fact that, you know, she's bouncy. And, like, it's just, there's this whole interaction. There's John. Fuck John. <laughs> John's an asshole. No one likes John. To the John who regularly listens and watches the podcast, you know who you are. You're not an asshole, except John, when you are an asshole. John, <laughs> John is the like tallest rectangle. He can jump wherever the fuck he wants, and he's always like, "Why can't you jump like me? Why are you so deficient?" And everybody else is like, "Fuck's sake, John, stop being an asshole." <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I, I, swells of joy, literal tears, um, you know, of, of happiness and wonderful feelings as I, as I watched these rectangles succeed, made, arguably, played this game, made these rectangles succeed, um, and I didn't care about any of that, um, what I cared about was these tiny little rectangles, so wonderful. <laughs> I'm all like, oh. Yeah, whereas my man feels I always thump my chest because the, the emotion's trying to fight its way out. I was like, <clears throat> you gotta get feels. lower. You, the man, your man feels are in the subcockle area. Yeah, uh, but it doesn't hurt as much when I hit here. <laughs> I know. Wow. I know. Uh, how about games that make you do stuff? Like games that legitimately change your behavior. Um, better Ryan. Uh, so I have. Oh yeah, I, I have two for this, and I think it's tradition that a Ryan always has two answers. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I'll start with Halo because this was the first game that my friends and I really got into. I believe I mentioned this at the top. Um, we had. LAN parties of Halo. And this was not something that... Which is an, a, an incredible undertaking when you're, like, 12? Like, yeah, 12, 13, somewhere yeah. in there. Like, it, it was an ordeal. Like, we had to get our parents to drive us over to each other's houses to bring the TVs and the Xboxes with us. Uh, someone always got stuck with a giant controller because we didn't have all of the controller S's yet. Uh, look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. They're huge. It's the size of a house. It's, it's <laughs> dinner plate esque. Um, but this changed the entire way that we sort of interacted with each other. It was no longer simply like getting together and just hanging out and watching a movie or something. Um, we didn't have like things to do in my town, so we couldn't actually go anywhere. It would just mm-hmm. be hanging out at someone's house. Mm-hmm. Um, but now it was always get together and play Halo. Um, and a lot of it was us interacting with like our older siblings in the same way because they would bring their friends and so we could have bigger groups. We would have like 16 player matches which doesn't sound like much now but it was huge back then. Yeah, when you had to wire together four Xboxes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was it was an ordeal. Uh and, you know, we would have them in different rooms so we couldn't see each other's teams. It was a whole thing. Like, it completely changed the way that we spent our weekends. Because every weekend was Halo Party at someone's house. Um, the other one for me is World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm. Which, every I think everyone has at least... If they haven't experienced themselves, they know someone who has experienced this. Yep. And I do mean experienced, not played. <laughs> because you don't just play well. I mean, you can, especially now. But really early on, you didn't just play WoW. You had a job in WoW. Because that's yep. what you needed to do to be serious in that game. Yeah, it was important that you were serious about that game. Yes. Because if you weren't, you were the noob. You were a fucking casual. Yeah. I never played it, so... <laughs> yeah. It it was an experience. Um, nope. I don't... I wouldn't go back and change it necessarily, but let's just... For me, WoW was both... This really improved my mental health state and uh, the things that I did, and then really dragged it all down. 
Uh, towards the end of high school, I didn't really have a lot of friends, not actual friends. I had a lot of strong acquaintances, but mm -hmm. real friends weren't really existing anymore. Um, but what I did have was World of Warcraft. Mm -hmm. So I would spend all of my evening, and oftentimes early in the morning, playing WoW. Uh, hanging out with guildmates that I actually became legitimate friends with. Um, even as they became very surprised and then weird when they found out how old I was, uh, especially after hearing me over uh, Ventrilo when that first came out. Uh, turns out my voice translates online as very, very deep, as opposed to just normally very deep. Uh, everyone thought I was about 40. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I assume you've sounded like this since you were five. Uh, <laughs> mid-teens, somewhere in there, at the very least, because that's when I was playing WoW, and uh, let's just say some older ladies semi-flirting with me went downhill after they found out how old I was. <laughs> Thankfully. I have the voice of a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> yeah, slightly different experience. You might still get the interactions that way, but going a different way. It's okay, I mostly watch YouTube and interact with the world like a 12-year-old boy. It's fine. Yeah. Uh... So th this was in high school, so it was actually like a positive in a way, um, because I couldn't really go out and make new friends. Uh, my town had a limited population. I knew all the people. Um, <laughs> there was no way of actually going out and making new friends. Uh, but So this is a way for me to actually be social and have something to do and not just dwell on the fact that my friends had moved on to save my sister to hang out with. Uh, it reminds but, me, when can we get her on the podcast? Uh, give it time. <laughs> Unrelated. Uh, she 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 has two small children, so Unre you know. Unrelated note. <laughs> uh, then came university, where I should have go been going out and making new friends, and instead I was playing WoW. So it made me stay in that and be the job of WoW, like spending hours and hours raiding or preparing to raid. Uh, gathering materials for potions gotta and things flasks. like that. Oh, you got to get your flask. You got to make sure you're flasked up. Can't come on the raid unless you got 300 fire resist. Yep, 375. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't remember the number? I remember. Uh, it, it was just a, a nightmare. Looking back on it now, it's like this is the time that I wasted. This, I had all of this free time, and all I did was spend it, you know, literally in a cave underground. Yeah, yeah. I've been there, man. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm better now. But uh, that that was sort of a low point. Uh, to the point where sometime when I was living in Toronto doing a co-op job, my computer broke and I couldn't get it fixed for a week. Um, that was the worst week of my life. <laughs> I have a... We we should do we should do a podcast uh, sometime about that time our computers broke because I feel like we all have one of those stories. Yes, uh, I think I've told mine on the podcast before, but um, yeah, I guess I'll go next. Uh, games that make me do stuff. Skyrim. Oh my god! I mean, I have also like I have pissed away a ton of time playing Skyrim. I think I've clocked over a thousand hours in it. Uh, I try to stream every Tuesday, and that is the thing that Skyrim got me doing is. I was sort of pissing about with streaming before last summer when I was doing a bit of Minecraft. I, like, I had this idea that I wanted to do this thing, but I didn't know what I wanted to do or how I wanted to do it. I was just sort of playing around. And I came back from Scotland, and I was like, what do I want to do? I want to stream, but I don't know what. And uh, I was like, I should just stream my super dorky Skyrim game. I should just do it. I should just not be self-conscious about it. And I should do it. And I have been doing it. And it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's nerdy as hell. We play... Because I haven't even done everything in Skyrim. I, the, I, there's a whole DLC that I've never touched. I have never been to Soul's Time and done Dragonborn. Oh. Never. <laughs> I have played a thousand hours. And I have played a ton of dress-up. I have done almost all the other things. I have modded the hell out of it. We have, we're running 250 some odd mods. Um, I have made characters and remade characters and told stories and fallen in love and and 
I had to like I got I got to the point where I had to invent a new way to play it because it was more fun. It let me tell more stories in the same world. Because I got sad that every time I finished sort of that that segment of it, I had to leave that world behind and all the things that had changed. Yep. And then I and I was like, you know what I should do? This is so dorky that this thing that is so dorky that I could barely admit it to other human beings without like constantly being embarrassed by by the mere notion of it. I should stream this so people can watch it. <laughs> the weird thing uh, is people watch it. I must share this. Kind of. And it, it helped me actually get through, like, I felt like I was telling stories in the wrong place because I wasn't writing. I wasn't, um, you know, telling you stories in d and I wasn't making videos. I was playing Skyrim. And I always got to be making stuff. So I was like, I will learn to make things. While talking about Skyrim and talking about like the weird ass way that I play it, I'll throw a I'll throw a link to the there's a I I, I wrote a I, I got tired of explaining it to people so I wrote a stream ex, or I like guess a, a stream explanation on my website <laughs> so I'll throw a link to that. But yeah, games that make me do stuff that that game that game made me stay up all night trying to avoid a marriage one time. <laughs> First time I ever got married in that game. No, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. It wasn't. I was. It was just. I didn't realize how sudden it was, and so I, I like. I went and I got my amulet and I, I came up to this entrepreneur that I had fancied and I was like, hey, and she yeah. was like, hey, and I'm like, hey, and she's like, yeah, and I'm like, yep. She's like, okay, let's get married tomorrow. I'm like, that's kind of a big step. So I went and killed entire god vampires immortal creatures of the night etc etc literally all night in uh, in a night that was a grievous mistake because I had to work in the morning and then I came back and I got married uh, and it was, wonder- it was wonderful and we were blissfully happy etc etc <laughs> you didn't sacrifice her for the epic mail or anything no I could never do that. No. Just checking. I also didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. Jesus. No. <laughs> a thousand hours. You haven't discovered the awful parts yet, have you? I have discovered many of the awful parts, but I have not discovered all of Skyrim by any stretch of the imagination. Um, how about you, Huck? What makes you do things? So I hate to, to tread back on, on a game that I've already talked about. Murr, but murr, 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 I know. Murr. I know. I feel like I should... But I guess I'm not a gamer. I don't have a wide experience of games, but gamesman. I'm gamesman. Sorry, games person. Um, but I'm going to come back to Rock Band on this one. Um, I had played guitar a little bit, you know, when I was ten. I took some lessons. I played a little bit of guitar in the states when you, you, the classes that you took in school, because they were slightly better funded, meant that you could take classes with musical instruments. Mm-hmm. So I, played, I took guitar. So I played guitar in grade six. It was actually a split, like keyboard and guitar. So like half the term was keyboard, half the term was guitar. Um, and then I played a little bit after I discovered Metallica because <laughs> I got a tab book <laughs> and yeah. I, I learned some of the riffs. Um, and then I played a little bit in undergrad, but I was never really super serious. It was just I was a riff jockey. You know, I would learn really cool riffs, but I wouldn't string it all together. And then we started playing rock band, and I knew enough of how a guitar operated that I could tell when stuff in the game had to be simplified in order to accommodate the gaming experience with the mm-hmm. controller. Like, for example, the, I feel like the, the biggest wasted opportunity was that um, Guitar Hero Metallica figured out how to do open string palm muted strumming. Like Rock Band didn't seem to innovate that, and I think until much later, and then they just had weird innovations. But you know, being able to like, that, 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 right yeah. without having to push anything down in Rock Band Two, I was always like, wow, why do I have to push down the green button to do something that I know would be an open string palm mute, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, but we were playing all these games, and I was getting half decent on guitar, and out, out of the group, I was the drummer. So I got half decent playing drum, well, drums with four <laughs> pads and a kick pedal. 
a kick pedal that I couldn't really like fit in the drum kit, so the kick pedal was on the other side, so I was just tapping my foot as opposed to like bouncing it up and down. <laughs> uh, but I, w- I was playing these songs. I'm like, you know, I could play some of these songs, and so I started to to learn how to play them. And like we played. Um, uh, Everlong, yep. for example, for the music challenge. I'm not saying that we played it in rock band, but it was after I had been introduced to rock band, I think, that, and I was buying guitar. Brian one. savanted his way through Everlong. <laughs> I, was, I was stunned. I picked up the guitar and I was like, yeah, I, I learned this, like, I don't know, six years ago, and I haven't really played Flawlessly it Flawlessly plays the song from start to finish. Uh, like, so you're playing guitar in this one, eh? Yeah, apparently. Uh, so yeah, uh, rock band got me to play music a little bit more seriously um after my rock band experience i I got my own electric guitar um i play it a lot more especially now that there is rocksmith which is the 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 circle comes complete you actually plug your musical instrument into the game and play that instead so i mean like that i I suppose that has gotten me playing like if you're going to strongly say it in any way that has got me playing my instrument, but Rock Band was, I think, the one that spurred on that desire to play more music. So Nice. I mean, I guess the last the last idea is games that make you... Like, change the way you think. And I think it's my turn to go first. Yeah. Yes. So mine... God, I have a bunch. Um, like, Minecraft. I haven't talked about Minecraft very much, but... Um, Minecraft gave me an insight into the fact that I love I love designing processes in games and in, in things in general like like I wouldn't just build some I, I never wanted to like build something big or ostentatious or anything like that I wanted to build something that, that worked that had a function that's that that met a, a need and then automate that thing and iterate on that design um, weirdly enough, I do that as a job as well, so I guess it's not that strange. Um, but I did not at the time. Like I remember building building machines and playing Feed the Beast, and just just like I was the guy who would find something or some really weird corner case and use it to essentially translate into unlimited resources. You know, I I, I centrifuge I pumped all the lava from the Never Nether accidentally one time into my house. Accidentally. Where, where, no, it was pretty accidental. Where I centrifuged all of it into various metals and then further refined it into all kinds of other things. So I had, you know, unlimited nuclear reactors and things like that. And I didn't notice it was a problem. Yeah, I, I remember you describing your domicile in Minecraft as the cube. The cube! And then you oh. showed it to me at one point, and it was an actual, just, it's a cube. It, it, it is gun, entirely yeah. utilitarian. Yeah. And there's a guy over there with a jetpack f- full of magic just wiping out towns. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. you're doing this. No, I built a cube, and it was entirely utilitarian, and every, every sort of, like, segment of it had a purpose. And that purpose was to provide me with the resources to do whatever I wanted. And... Yeah, it wasn't until somebody went to my the other side of my nether portal and was like, Hey, Jim, have you looked outside for a while? I'm like, no, I've been in the cube for literal months. I got really lonely in here, so I put a tempered glass explosion-proof skylight on the top made of tungsten. Um, so now it's, it's open-topped. It's a convertible cube. And they're like, that's interesting. Have you looked outside? And I looked outside, and then lava was just gone. <laughs> it was lagging out the server. My storage system was lagging that I designed was lagging out the server so badly um, <laughs> that they made me take it apart. <laughs> um, yeah, it was a whole thing. But but for me, it's probably Dragon Age Two. Dragon Age Two changed the way I think about stories and games, um, and that that is transferred over to D and D. It's transferred over to the way I tell stories in real life. It's. You know, not only does the story happen over multiple ages, relatively seamlessly, like 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 the ability to not play a game start to finish. Where I mean, that's the, like the the weird thing about a lot of games like that, you know, Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Baldur's Gate, is the the whole thing seemingly happens in like two weeks. You know, it's just it's just at one minute. You're nobody, and and two weeks later, 
You are the most important person in the world. And Dragon Age 2 just 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 took a bunch just put spaces in there. And I love that. It gave me the it gave me room to sort of fill that in with my own stuff. It reminded me that was where I started doing character customizations and started thinking of of my character as the the sort of object of this story that I'm telling and imagining what their needs are. Now I can't make a character without doing that. Like that was the beginning of the whole like Skyrim multiplicity thing was playing Hawk and Dragon Age and being like, no, these are my character values. You know, I, I when I when I when the time came to make the the big choice about Anders, I I was like, I have killed better men for less. I can't. I can't let you walk. It's a whole thing. I had real feels. It was great. But it and, and it and it has affected it has affected me so profoundly that I have no desire to ever go back and play that game because I got the perfect game. I can't think of anything that I would have wanted. Like, like, even the things that I wanted to do differently happened. And they happened... They, they, did not, they may not have happened as I intended them to, but they happened as they were meant to. See, and when I, I go back to that game fairly frequently, but for me it's like a sliding doors thing. Like, I want to see... The other thing, if mm-hmm. I didn't take this path, what is the other mm-hmm. way that I go? What is the other hawk that is out there? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I have my hawk, and I know who they are, and that's that's enough for me. What's your what's your uh, thinking game, man? Uh, so the thinking game for me, I think there are. I'm going to go with two again because apparently I'm indecisive. It's fine. You're just yeah. being a Ryan. It's yeah, okay. That's, yeah, that's. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. podcast it, tradition. It, it's now that you're the better Ryan. You get two answers for everything. Excellent. <laughs> um, so I think for me, these are the ga- uh, the gaming moments that maybe think differently about games, um, and they're sort of the polar opposites of each other. Right. Okay. The first is Ocarina of Time, um, which I played through more times than I can actually think of at this point uh, because I started when I was younger and I've played through it so many times you since. cool guys are in 64s. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when I... I played the game so many times that eventually I wanted to challenge myself. I'd already done literally everything that can be done in that game, so I wanted a challenge. And I decided to beat the entire game only with the original three hearts that you get at the beginning. Uh, none of the life upgrades, none of the half damage things, nothing. Sounds if, challenging. If I could help it, it was fairly challenging. I allowed myself a fairy at some points, but that was it. Uh, otherwise, it was just game over is game over. You gotta go back through as much as you have to. Uh, Permadeath. Wow. Well, not not right from the beginning. But oh yeah. no, because it's got same points. Yeah, yeah. It's more like restart the dungeon. Yeah. Um. So I, this was the first time I really made things harder for myself on purpose. Uh, something that I've done since, but that was the first time that I can really recall, I want this to be harder, this is what I'm going to do. Because I still want to experience this game, but it's not boring, but it's too, it's not challenging enough. Um, sort of the opposite end of that was my experience with Final Fantasy XIII. Uh, because I got through the prologue of that game, which is about 22 hours in. <laughs> God. Uh, because, you know, Final Fantasy games. Uh, but I kept hearing people say, like, this is when the game gets good. This is when it opens up and you can do all these different things. And I got to that point and was like, I'm done. I don't have any more time for you. Game that I like, but not enough for this. I have things to do. Yeah, there's that feeling when you when you're you're like I I like this game, but I I'm gonna put it away, and and I might never come back to it. And I like the bit that I saw, but yeah, yeah. And it it was it's sort of weird because I still feel like I really enjoyed the parts that I was in, but you know I've invested more time into say uh, Skyrim for example, mm-hmm. and I played it afterwards, and I had no problem spending dozens of hours doing not very much in that game, but 
something about the nature of it made me want to go back to it as opposed to uh, Final Fantasy XIII when I realized there are some games that are too big for me Fair. that I just I don't have the time for anymore. Ugh, got to follow up on that. Um, my biggest thing with games that make me think is when games show me what they're capable of and what ca- the medium is capable of. And, that, I mean, there's a couple examples over time where I got inklings, inklings of that. Um, Warcraft 2, I felt that way when I first learned about, you know, the divergent stories and whatnot, and, and you could have both sides of the war. I mean, effectively, it's the same game, just coded different with different voice acting but um so i mean I, I had it with that i had it with kingdom hearts because i didn't get into final fantasy until much later so that really mm-hmm. expanded world uh was the first time i saw something like that um and there's you know a smattering of 64 games and whatnot that had cool mechanics but i would say the one that made me think the most uh in terms of what a game is capable of is when i finally got borderlands 2 and this was after Headshots. Yeah, because yeah, I remember. Because remember, uh, year two, you asked me to be a host or whatever on yep. camera. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And I played, what, five hours in prep because I didn't have a lot of lead-in time. I'm not a very good gamer, so I didn't get very far. I just played five hours, and then we far surpassed anything I had experienced in the game. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, well, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to talk about it in my ass because I don't know. I don't even know the names of the little, little creatures running around, let alone you know anything to do with the story. Um, but when I finally got my hands on it and played through it, the, the expansive world, the in-depth characters, the cool um, fighting mechanics, like the gun mechanics, just the, the novelty of you know the infinite combinations of it. Um, the level of wit built into it, just how smart and funny it is. I think my favorite is the the one, um, uh, not badass. Um, the, the basic marauder ones, the ones that run at you and, sh- and quote Shakespeare. Psychos, psychos. There we go. Yeah, it's been a while since I played it, but like, yeah, there was ones the psychos that are are quoting Shakespeare at you. And then the one that was just randomly ranting, telling you to like kill him and stuff like that. He's just I I sat there and I watched the entire animation and the entire uh, dialogue just to hear what he had to say before I finally popped him and boom, mission complete. That was all it was. Is you had to pop him. Yep. Um. It it set the bar for me what a what a game could do, not just because it was sixty hours of, of story, but it was. After that point, for a long time, Borderlands 2 was the yardstick that I measured all other games. Batman mm. Arkham City was compared against it. You know, like if it was a short game, like Ghostbusters, for example, great game because I love Ghostbusters and I was like always so sad of how short it was because it was essentially a five hour movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but uh, yeah, so so Borderlands got me to, to realize and think about just how how expansive. And because remember, I'm a console gamer. I'm not a PC gamer. I, I didn't have a lot of experience with these super in depth RPGs, you know, like the, the Dragon Ages and whatnot and Skyrims and, and whatnot. So this is. All oh, those games came out for console. I know, but I didn't. Like, <laughs> all of my friends played them on, on PC. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. I yeah, my, I my the closest I got to it before I started playing was my former roommate Doug. He would play Fable or whatever, and yep. I would come over to his house, do laundry, drink beer, and watch him play. <laughs> because he knew that when we played co op, I'd fall asleep while playing, and I was like the shittiest person to play co op games with. Uh, like Marvel <laughs> Ultimate Marvel Alliance two, you know, like just a fantastic game, but it's just like uh, there's me running into the corner, Huck, you know. Like, <laughs> God, uh, Castle Crashers, uh, same thing. Like I, he, I'd be dying all over the place. Never inviting you to play co-op. No, it's totally. Understood. I, I would just. It would be late at night, and I'd fall asleep. So that was me. Oh, I guess the conclusion is play more games. Yeah, yeah. Always play games. Always play games. Uh, in the meantime, you can find us on social media below. And uh, yeah, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I am Mother Ryan. And we're signing off. Stay awesome. Uh, have you ever watched one of these podcasts before? Mm, no. You're a traitor and you're not my friend anymore.